the behalf of BH Brilliant Minds Project Inc. I would like to thank you all for taking our time from your busy schedule to join us for our Tap In Series number five, facilitated by Miss Gigi Crowder. Tap In Series is our love language by which we are creating a platform to highlight and uplift people of color, brilliance, vibrant spirit, resilience, boldness, and our gift to love and laugh. This evening series is in honor of our icon giant, civil rights leader and house representative, John Lewis. And I would like to give thanks to the Lord for his life. I believe our ancestors are saying to us, Walk in your purpose. Now it's your time and turn. Just a friendly reminder to those that are listening and participating. We will be uploading this series to www.bhbrilliantminds.org. If you participate in this series via Zoom, via Facebook, or phone, you are giving us the authorization to record you, your voice, and comments. I also would like to give thanks to our sponsor, Akinati Foundation, So Love Can Win Grant. I want to share, Miss Samantha will be the control person of the board. Raise your hand, Miss Samantha. Give them a look. Okay. Now that we have gotten the business out of the way, it is my honor to pass the torch to my sister friend, Ms. Gigi Crotter, co-founder of Mental Health Friendly Communities and Black Minds Matter Too. She is our Shiro warrior and champion who fights for us. I would like to remind us that July is Majority Mental Health Awareness Month. Tonight's topic is Black Lives Minds have always, and lives, have always mattered. Ms. Gigi Crotter, I give it over to you. Thank you, Barbara, for inviting me to uh, participate in this effort. I appreciate Barbara Howard so much. Every year, Barbara is the facilitator of the Juneteenth Festival in Oakland, and this is the first year after 12 that she hasn't had the, didn't have the opportunity to do her Juneteenth Festival. But we had a chance to come together anyhow because she invited me to this, so I really appreciate that. I also appreciate looking out and seeing all the people that I love and care about looking back at me. Today is really about us um, actually shifting over and just as I was giving Barbara the title and, and reminding her that this was Minority Mental Health Awareness Month, the state got all 2020 on us and said, people of color are no longer a minority in California, so now it is Black Indigenous People of Color Mental Health Awareness Month. Wow. Black Indigenous People of Color Mental Health Awareness Month. So we appreciate the fact that the state recognizes the um, demography in this, uh, in, this, um, in this state. Did that make, did that word make sense, Pastor Jones, demography, or did I just make it up? <laughs> he makes up words as a pastor, so sometimes I will. Demographics. <laughs> Demographic, is that the word you was looking for? Huh? You were looking for demographics? I, I know that. I was oh. making up a new word, just like you do. Just like transformational, with action hey. in it. This will be a transformational. This is what we do. We're this there what we do. Do your thing. This will be a transformational all right now. experience for all of you. And as it's our tradition in the African-American community, we always start with a prayer. So I've invited Pastor Horacio Jones to participate in this with an opening prayer for what we want to achieve today. Thank you, Pastor Jones. A black man with a Spanish name. Thank you so much, <laughs> Gigi. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, we bless you, and we give you honor and praise. We pause for just a moment to honor the life and the legacy of uh, champion of the cause who care with such compassion and love for those uh, who were oppressed, those of our community, Representative Lewis. And we pray, God, that you would bless and comfort 
and keep his family and all those who, not from a political perspective, but from a personal perspective, who are so impacted by his transition. We pray for our community, we pray for our nation, for we have lost an icon, a champion of those, oh God, who are oppressed. And so we thank you for his life and we make a commitment to continue his legacy. Yes. Father, we ask that as you breathed into Adam in the garden and he became a living soul, as you breathed upon the Red Sea and enabled your people to transition from bondage to freedom, walking across dry land. That Father God, as you breathed upon um, your people and the nation of Israel, oh God, and reminded them in the midst of their wilderness that they were a people who were called, a people who were chosen. Father, we're mind, reminded of Christ Jesus as he hung on the cross and he breathed his last breath and entrusted his soul his spirit into your presence. And Father, then we're minded on the day of Pentecost when you breathe into the church. So Father, as we focus on mental wellness of the African-American community, that our minds and our lives matter more now than ever before, we pray, oh God, that you would breathe life, take us and transcend us beyond the natural, that we would understand our purpose and our call, not as a vocation, but as a calling. We thank you for the life that you shall speak and reveal through this web, this gathering and this webinar tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. And so I do wanna share that sometimes whenever we do our prayer in the African-American community, it's uncomfortable for some individuals, especially individuals outside of our community. But I did want to share that it's how we heal as a community for many of us. I'm a, a, the chair of the statewide California Mental Health and Spirituality Initiative. And we did surveys across the state for all those who believe that faith and spirituality should be a essential part of healing when someone lives with a mental health challenge. And 88% of African Americans agreed that faith, prayer, et cetera, was a form of healing. So I've shared uh, at, through the Juneteenth uh, celebrations with the county of Contra Costa County, I've had individuals do the opening prayer and I had a couple of individuals saying, can we do that? Well, the simple answer is yes. Yay, because it's a healing uh, source for us and it's not breaking any separation of church and state laws. It's what needs to happen in order for us to advance efforts in our community. A lot of people have shared with me, the only place they feel safe is sometimes Sunday mornings. African-Americans experience from day to day, a lot of what we call microaggressions in the world of work. And so being in a safe environment with people much like them where they can freely hug, kiss before COVID-19, others is uh, how so many heal. So. I appreciate the fact today that we have, and always, whenever we're doing these trainings, we like to lift up the voice of individuals who have personal living experience with mental health. So first, we're going to have an individual I've only met a short a time ago, but she's impacted my life in such a way that I pretty much shifted the way I do my work, um, because I'm now going to the primary source, which is what do we need to do to improve health outcomes for those who live with mental illness? As the uh, executive director of NAMI Contra Costa County, I want to acknowledge the fact that our president, Don Green, is here on this call, as well as one of our founding um, FaithNet members. I saw Kay DeRico, who her face isn't showing, but she's here, and both Don, wave Don, and Kay, who may not decide to wave, will uh, we'll be there. And then Kalia is here from our statewide California Mental Health and Spirituality Initiative. But the most heroic person on this call for me right now, well, there's two, but the most heroic is Tan Hall. And I'm going to let her share her story and why working with her and the friends of Scott, Alexis, and Tan Hall to ensure that individuals who come to NAMI, as she did, get all the resources they need to improve the health outcomes for their loved ones take place. So, Tom, you ready? 
Hi, everybody. Uh, Gigi, thank you so much for having me today. And Barbara, thank you as well. You're welcome. And all the people on the call. Uh, so, Miles, I mean, Miles, we, there's a little background there. Um, I, I raised my son with my husband and my daughter uh, in Walnut Creek. We moved there when Miles was five years old, and we had the vision that we were going to live the American dream. Got the good schools, got the nice community, nice house, got the picket fence, you know, two cars and a dog. And so we, we really believed that we were living the American dream. And my son was vibrant. He was smart. He was a lover, like just a, a, in the soul, just a good person. And he had he had hopes and dreams and he, he had plans for himself. Uh, and I know that uh, in his freshman year of high school, uh, he played basketball and he was on the honor roll and he was, he was thriving and doing really well. We did start noticing a change within his mental health. And that was around uh, probably when he, when he graduated from high school is when we really, really noticed it. We were noticing things in high school for him, but it was more of the, you know, not really having plans for after, call, after school, that kind of thing. So we were just like, okay, what's this about? Um, but we kind of just let it go. I, I had a feeling something was going on though, uh, but it was very apparent after he graduated from high school because he started kind of uh, having a manic state where he, <coughs> where he believed he was Jesus. And, um, and it was frightening because he started going around the neighborhood and, and knocking on some people's doors. We live in Walnut Creek. It's a, it's a white neighborhood. And um, Miles is African American. And I know that doing something like that is, is a little more dangerous for him. So I, I immediately um, let my neighbors know, you know, break the stigma that something's going on. I don't know exactly what's happening. But I let them know, and I communicated uh, regularly with them. I also did take, as not as Gigi said, I did take a family family class at NAMI, and that gave me some tools and resources. I already had a bachelor's degree in, in psychology, so I knew I knew like some like bipolar, schizoaffective, those schizophrenia. Those were like kind of things that were on my mind. But I really thought it was more bipolar for him, for sure. Uh, so I took a family family class. It was like. A, eight week class and I got a lot of maybe 12 weeks, but it was a lot, it was a lot of information about like what to do. So I was now, I felt like I had some resources. And one of the things they did say is that just, especially with Miles and his behavior going door to door is that the law enforcement also know who your, who your child is. So I, so when, at one time when Miles was having his, one of his episodes, I knocked on the door and I let the, um, I mean, I, I didn't knock on the door. When he was knocking on the door, I let the, um, the police know about him. So I was calling the non-emergency line. And so then from that point, I, I re established a relationship with the police. And um, I had also learned at the Znami class that there was a conservatorship opportunity. So I also believe that, I also knew that that was in my back pocket as something else. Um, so it was almost impossible getting him a 5150, but with the help of the police in 2018, I was, we were successful. And as soon as we got that 5150, Miles, he got some injection with a medication and he was doing great. He got a job right away. He was making friends. He had people come over. It was like a whole shift. So all he needed was a medication, right? And he was a different person and ready to excel and, and live his best life. So we were excited for that. We just really felt that that could happen for him. And um, so those were like the eight months after that hospitalization. And then Miles started like on June 1st, we started noticing it happened really fast, but we noticed again that he was doing the door knocking. He was thinking he was Jesus. He was very elevated and um, had a manic state. So I, I also, again, at, on June 1st, let the, the law enforcement, I called the non-emergency line. I called, had a personal relationship now with the mental health officer. I called her. And I was left, you know, I spoke to someone and they're like, yeah, we remember you. We know who you are. We were able to get miles of 5150 last year. So we're happy to help. So I was confident that the next day when miles was actually in a full blown psychosis and he was in a mental health emergency that they were going to come and take care of our, take care of our family and take care of miles and treat him with compassion. And they did not, they came immediately. 
within, there was five officers that came right on the scene in a large cul-de-sac, brightly lit area, quiet. And Miles has a, he has a garden tool that he's running with and he's running away from the officers. And I do encourage you all, if you haven't seen the video, to go to justiceformileshaw.org because it really does tell the story. Because I can tell you this, but when you see this, when you see what happened and how they, they gunned down my child, they mur I mean, he was murdered that day. Um, it didn't need to happen. I mean, they literally came, five officers, and two of them shot him in the side. While he was trying to go home, they were blocking his path home. Mm -hmm. so, so now the work that we're doing um, is to change the laws because we can't have, because Miles died. Um, and now we are changing the laws. We want to change the laws. So there's a non-police response to the mentally ill. We don't want the police to come. They're not trained enough. And now that's, we have a group of, of Scott, Alexis, and Tom Hall that are now working to make that change here in, in Walnut Creek. And Gigi's also with NAMI has been an in instrumental part of making us get this change. And I am grateful for, for you, Gigi, and the, and the help and guidance you provided our family. Thank you, Ton. I know that Ton regularly has a meeting at six o'clock that's happening right now. Did anyone want to share anything? This is a community dialogue. So that's why we're doing it this way. That's why you see all the faces. Does anyone have any specific questions for Ton before we move on? Are these shy people? <laughs> well, if you do, like she said, you can go to www.justiceformileshall.org and look at the video and hear about all the great work they're doing to create change for families. Okay. All right. Thank you, Todd. I know you have yeah, to get back. Wanna, you might want to stick around and hear from Todd. Yeah, I'm not leaving you. played yet. an instrumental part in the life of Miles living um, with personal um, mental health experience itself. So if you take yourself off of mute, Todd, and introduce yourself, we, um, when we do our trainings, as I said, we like to put a face on what we're working with. So you were ready when you are, Todd. Hi, how's everybody doing? Um, yeah, Miles. Miles was a great kid. Like, like Tom said, that was that was my buddy, um, and I I got to to bear witness to to his his um, his mental break. And as someone who struggles with with mental illness himself, it was it was one of those things where I was. I was very fortunate that Miles looked up to me enough to want to hear what I had to say. And I related enough to Miles um, to be able to help him somewhat, you know, for what I could do. Like, we started going outside and, and playing basketball. and He wouldn't leave the house anymore. And um, it, it were very small steps. Um, and I, I wish I could have been there more. It, it broke my heart to hear what happened to Miles. I had um, I had literally just got out of hospitalization myself when uh, my mom called me. Sorry. <laughs> it's, okay. it's understandable. It's understandable. It's okay, Todd. This yes, is the human hurt experienced in the community. Absolutely. And we need to most definitely, as you were talking about the mental state, we, instead of holding the things in, we have to, our tears are healing. So we have to let it go. We have to let, let it out. And I thank you. And I recommend you menu for allowing to be expressed and to be open, to be able to do that, because this is what it's about. For the longest time, I wasn't able to accept you know, yeah. having a mental illness and it's, it's not something you want to talk about. It's not, it's very taboo, especially in that African American community to say that you have a mental disorder, you know, it's almost like a cop out and, you know, you do things like masks with substance and, and, uh, you know, 
we use excuses like anger issues or hard upbringing when, you know, all it takes is, like Tom said, a little bit of medication. Um, a little over a year ago, I had a, a manic breakdown. I'm, I'm manic bipolar as well as manic depressive with a, acute schizophrenia. Acute schizophrenia. Um, and I ended up on the top of a hotel in Las Vegas, I, looking down at the, at the ground and all the cops below, feeling like I had, you know, no other choice. Looked like he may have frozen for a minute there. I'm going to ask anyone who's not speaking to please put their their um, their uh, phones on mute if you're on the phone, computer on mute if you're on the computer, if you know you have background noise, because we can hear it. Todd, are you ready again? This is actually his first time using Zoom, and because of his special relationship with um, Miles and the Haas family, he wanted to do this. So if he's able to become unfrozen on his phone, we will have give him a chance to finish what he's speaking about. So that he'll, he'll probably have to uh, dial back in. But what I wanted to do, which is what I always do, after the Black Lives Matter movement got going, I went to at least six protests we should shut one off. where they said we were gonna do eight minutes and 46 seconds of silence in honor of Floyd uh, George Floyd. And I had a difficult time with that because when we're doing those eight minutes and 46 seconds, we're not doing it with a knee in our neck fighting for breath. What instead we do when I have control over the meeting is we do 23 seconds of silence in honor of Miles Hall, who was right here in our area, in our backyard, who didn't get an opportunity. So while we're waiting for Todd to get re-situated, we're gonna take those 23 seconds and think about what it might've been like had we had the appropriate services in place for this young man whose mom and family did the right thing. So we're gonna start right now with 23 seconds of silence for Miles Hall. Thank you. I appreciate everyone who's jumped on the Black Lives M M uh, Matter movement, but that's the name of this conference or town hall is Black Minds Also Matter. And a fact that people need to understand is that when a person lives with mental illness, they're even more likely to be killed by law enforcement, even more than unarmed African Americans. Those who live with mental illness are the ones most at risk. So you, when you think about Miles, you think about the fact that he had a mental illness and he was African-American. That means he had a heightened risk for being shot and killed because, because there's such a uh, implicit bias that takes place. So Todd, I'm not sure if you're ready to finish what you were sharing with us. Yeah, okay. sorry, my phone overheated. It's hot in Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was set, all it took was a little medication, well, a lot of the right medications to get me uh, functioning and, and able to, to rejoin society with a whole different outlook. Um, you know, most of us don't know it. We're, we're either not diagnosed or misdiagnosed or we self-medicate with illegal, sus illegal substances and they mask and then and then they tend to heighten your mental illness. Um, as far as police response goes, I I can tell you firsthand it's it's always over exaggerated. I, I had three police officers fight me in my mom's house during a manic state, you know, like literally fought me and and very easily could have killed me. My mom says that all the time. Um, but it's always a gross overreaction. When I was 
on top of that building in here in Vegas, you know, when I finally decided to step off the ledge, I had eight police officers tackle me to the ground. They ripped my clothes. They wouldn't even give me water. They took me to uh, not a mental health facility at first. They took me to a, a medical hospital and denied me access to a phone to, to talk to my family, wouldn't let me leave the room, and wouldn't feed me. You know, um, and and it was it was crazy because I, I'm listening to nurses talk in the hallway, making jokes about how crazy we are or how crazy I was and making light of me being on the, the edge of this, this building. And uh, it, it was heartbreaking, but then it opened my eyes to, to I, I had to start caring about me and my mental state because it's obvious that nobody else does. Nobody else does, you know? And I had a great support system. My mom was amazing. I had you know, some really close friends and family who, who made sure I stayed on, on that pill regimen. And if I, sh if I showed you the pills that I take every day, it's like 12 horse pills three times a day. It, it looks like I'm super sick. Those are the best things that ever happened to me. At first, I was tired all the time. I didn't like the feeling. And then I started to realize how different you know my outlook in life became and and i was able to function and i didn't see things the way they were and i, I didn't feel like i needed to give up you know and i haven't given up since life has been good i've been a productive member of society you know i i encourage people who have mental ailments to to seek all the help that they can um i continue with therapy because that was the biggest thing and i don't I don't drink or use any of other illegal substances anymore. Like it's it's been really good to me. It's Great. Been really good. Great Todd. I'm pretty sure Miles would be proud of you too. I I hope he is, because I do it for him every day. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, Todd, you made a big difference for Miles for sure. I mean, just when he was at his lowest, you were there with him, you know, and you didn't you saw him for who he was and you knew his, his heart and you knew how he was and a beautiful person I, and you just, me and miles had a deal yeah it was beautiful so thank you we had a deal i'll cut his hair every day for free as long as he graduated high school that was my buddy wow and he graduated he sure did that's perfect love you Tom. Thanks, Todd. I know you have to make it off to the other meeting, but it was important for you to hear Todd making his first public meeting. We try to get you. Todd to move down to the Bay Area so he can come and work with us. <laughs> I, it seems like it's something that should happen. It certainly does. Come home. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to do that. I think, I think a lot sooner than later as well. So thank you guys. Thanks thank for hearing me. Thanks so much. I see that um, Pastor Jones is still here and others. Does anyone have any questions for Todd? What's your diagnosis? Uh, I'm manic bipolar with the manic, I'm manic bipolar, manic depressant, and I have acute schizophrenia. You live with, with the, you're not that, with. you live with those, like, with those elements, but that's not who you are. I, I fight a win, I fight a winning battle with it every day. That's okay. great. Thanks for asking the question, Greg. I see there's some chats and it's like 12 of them inside of the room. Samantha, are you able to, um, are there questions there? Well, if anyone has a question, just unmute yourself and chime in because this is the way we do things in the African American community. Oh. We're very, they're Dia. Dia. Hi, Dia. I miss you. I miss you too. <laughs> um, I was in Walnut Creek this weekend in Broadway Plaza, and there was 
um, a rally for, was it Miles? Yes. Oh, I was a part of that rally just because I was so inspired, but I had no idea that it was this Miles. Yeah. Okay, now I feel even better that, that I would, could be a part of it, not better for the reason, but I feel honored that I was a part of it. Yeah, there's a group of young people that meet daily from noon to one, and then uh -huh. on Saturdays, and sometimes also on Sundays, they'll do the march, and it's uh, Justice for Miles Hall, right. and the big focus, as Tan said now, is to get a non-police response. Yeah. And we're hoping we can pilot in the name of Miles Hall. Well, they gave out a lot of really good information. I was really impressed with them. And um, I just, I didn't know what I was doing, but I was scooped up into the, to the feeling of the day and I became part of the rally. So um, it, it yeah. was lovely. I mean, if there can be such a, a thing, it was, it was very inspiring. Yeah, I was actually there too. Um, yeah, yeah. So I was part of that the rally that yeah. they walk at one thirty. So yeah, I'm glad that you were able to to experience yeah. it, be there, and and be moved by it too. Right? I was That's very amazing. moved by it. Yes, thank you. Todd, Todd, I have a question for you. So, what's what is like your favorite thing to do? My favorite thing to do? Yes. Um, hiding my motorcycle. I ride a Harley. I love it. <laughs> Wait a minute now. Do you have uh, some good leathers, a helmet, you know, all that stuff? Oh, yeah. I, I have all of that. <laughs> well, I don't wear leather. I wear, I wear a vest, a jean vest, but I have a good helmet. I love my bike. It, it helps me. It calms me down. It allows me to, to be at peace with my thoughts. Mm. Thank Do you, you think is is it the air, um, or is it the humming, the vibration? What is it's, that? Because I'm wondering if you can create that in other ways too. Sometimes when you when, can't ride. When I'm on my motorcycle, there's nothing else that I can focus on, or think about, or worry about, except for keeping those two wheels upright. Everything else has to go away. You know, for for that time, however far I'm going, for however long that ride is. The only thing I can can put my mind on is making sure I keep those two wheels on that road, and and that gives me peace. I don't have any more stress after that. That's good to hear. That's a good one. Now, I know that our um, I'm still able to get Ben Turner with us. He's becoming some of a celebrity, so I can't always get him as easily as I used to. But when Ben comes on, he blesses us all with spoken word, and so we. He has a commercial he's filling. Let's give Ben a for the fact that he's making things happen for himself and he followed his dream. And I'll let him share with you his story. But Ben, you ready to bless us with a spoken word? Yes, absolutely. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Benjamin. Um, um, I'm a little frazzled, uh, but thankful to be here and, and share my work. Um, I think some of you I've seen before and some of you have, I'm sure heard this poem before. So if you have, um, you know, forgive me, I'm, I'm definitely working on new work um, and hopefully there'll, there'll be something in this poem that you all will find valuable uh, or thinking about or something uh, of that nature. Um, uh, there's a poet who I know and love and have had the chance to write with. His name is Nate Marshall, if you ever get a chance to check out his work. Um, he wrote a poem called Habitual, and um, I wrote this poem after that one. Um, so it's after Nate Marshall's Habitual. Here, in America's two-toned asylum, we still add infinitum, AKA to them, we be Latin with pig on it. The feet or the intestine doesn't matter We've walked and stomached the forever for forever. Still, stay with me now. In America's two-toned asylum, we be brackish skinned and be tired. We be, but ain't is, is a problem. Do you feel? Ain't that a be attitude? Ain't been but for us. Ain't been but 
for 400 round from the bullets they launch at us. Just be wanting an olive branch, a benefit of the doubt, an exit from the ark. When beyond reasonable doubt, we are innocent and grappling with insanity. We be cats and dogs and primate if you let them tell it. We be flood, be shipwreck cove, be God stuck in bones, still walking on the floor of the Atlantic ad infinitum, ad infinitum, ad infinitum, ad nausea, ad the sickening, like a ritual rite. Took miles like it was ritual, right? Not for any God I ever knew, a blue badge, honor killing. I wonder how many seconds it took the officers to decide their life was in danger. I wonder how many seconds it took the officers to decide they would lie about their life being endangered. I wonder when being unwell meant you were unfit for life. It seems like it'd be every day plotting our demise. Maybe if miles had been more green mile, more magical Negro, but no, even then we still sent to the cage. Be a shame, but then they ain't got no shame. Be a system, but then who can afford health care anyway? And 5150 only working about 50, 51% of the time. And those be odds that ain't even worth feeling good about. And yet still, we be here. We be the reason here in America's two-tone asylum. It is legal to respond with lethal force to a cry for help. We be straight jacketed, hog tied, pillaged, ripped open, plundered, be spilling out clockwise, be picking ourselves up counter to. We be all of Zora Neale Hurston's unpublished notes, but be her unmarked grave too. And ain't ad nausea. We be every ad homonym, lighter language, lighter moment. In America's two toned Latin asylum, only the white of the roar shark is insane, be stained to them, be insane to them. But how sick you gotta be to make a cry for help, a wail of mourning. And yet, and still, against every odd, even then, we are, we be. Thanks so much, you guys. Appreciate it. Um, that's my poem. Thank you, Ben. You wanna share, Ben, how we met? Um, yeah, we met, oh uh, man, um, me and my auntie G met now 15 years ago-ish, 15 years ago. Yeah, um, right when I was 20, yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I was, I was a pretty... I was a pretty eccentric and and also troubled kid. I think the biggest issue was that I had a large range of emotions and had no language or processes or, or practice to regulate those emotions. Um, and so a lot of times what was going on at home where I wasn't able to express myself and I wasn't directed towards art yet no one had directed me towards art and that kind of became my saving grace. But before I was directed towards art and kind of found writing and found music and acting, I found a mime. Uh, I found a mime troupe in a church where we were praise dancing, painting our faces white. And I had two friends in this mime group. I had a, a bunch of friends, but two in particular I grew really close with, uh, Armand and Ryan Thea's box, who are Gigi's sons, her twin sons. Um, and oftentimes our mime practices on Monday nights would be pretty crazy. Um, there'd be a lot of attitudes and a lot of young testosterone and, and frustration. And me many times, worst of all, right? Uh, sort of finding the space to take objection, but also not knowing how to process all those emotions I had going on. So um, I would lash out or someone would lash out at me and I would make it worse and all these things would happen. So Gigi would be sitting outside with all the other parents waiting to get out like, what is going on? And we'd be in some meeting. And sometimes it would be me, sometimes it would be Gino, sometimes it would be Cameron, sometimes it would be all these kids who are always having an issue. And so Gigi kind of really just invited me in. I started going to their house all the time. We were painting shoes together. Uh, making clothes together and in the most loving way um, she left her door open for me so to speak um, she became family she made it her business to be my family she made it her business to 
to help shepherd who I was by pro providing a safe space that wasn't the home space, by providing space where I could be acknowledged and loved on and heard and cared for in ways that weren't overt, in ways that didn't make me feel stigmatized, in ways that affirmed what I was good at. I was always affirmed in Gigi's space. And so as that relationship grew and I had not just mine as a way to get feelings out, but I also had this new family that I was building, um, all of a sudden I was able to learn to regulate over time my emotions, both through having more community as well as finding art, finding writing, finding a way to sort of exercise all of these, both exercise as in, you know, EXE and exorcise as in pull out those things that were sort of haunting me. Um, and because of that, it really led way to a lot of the things I've been able to do today. Um, and I've been super thankful and blessed to to get full ride scholarships through an HBCU in Texas to get a full ride scholarship and, and fellowship to school in Detroit wow. to be able to be um, doing acting and screenwriting. Um, but all of those things were hard fought battles. I, I, I couldn't have gotten there, I think is the point, without the community. Um, since I, I think I was around 19 and, and that my gifting for sort of uh, writing and speaking, I wasn't even sure of it then, but around 19, Gigi just sort of put her hand on my shoulder and was like, come with me to this thing that I'm doing. Um, here's a green ribbon, here's a mic. And I didn't know, I didn't understand what it meant to be sp at speaking engagements about mental wellness or about the black well, the mental wellness of black young people or older people or just black folks in general. I didn't understand that, but I was being set up to be in a position to, to both thrive as well as receive resource from a bunch of, because now I'm hearing Pastor Jones speak about mental health and the origin. And now I'm hearing um, a Monique speak about family and mental health. And now I'm hearing all these clinicians and I'm shaking hands with people who are both clinicians as well as people who are using services. And so now I have a wider community and that's my interaction with Gigi. That's how I got introduced to this work. It's why I continue to call her auntie. It's why she's auntie in my phone. But more importantly, I think it's why community-based wellness and practices are so important um, within the black community. I, I say that not, not in a preaching way, but in a, test of, a testament to collectivity. And I'm a testament to community um, and that first really got its footing with folks like Gigi, as well as folks like Monique, who's also an auntie, as well as I didn't spoke at Pastor Jones' house, who's also um, sort of blessed me and taught me and guided me. So the, all these folks became community and that's how, how I'm here. Um, so yeah. I will share Ben has the most extensive vocabulary of anyone I've ever met. For a kid that said wasn't reading in the fifth grade, was it Ben? Yeah, it wasn't. To go on and uh, be on a debate team and win against. Now, what Ivy Ivy League college was that your team beat? Make me say this every time. Yes, I do, because I'm I, proud of you. It was Yale, wasn't it? Uh, um, it was Yale. Yeah, yes, we did. So they beat um, Yale. I am thankful. I am thankful. These kids who got school on scholarships beat these kids who were born with a silver spoon in their mouth, many of them. And so he actually inspired a um, training that we do called I'm a Winner. And I'm a Winner just reminds individuals that you can take a look at someone and not see their potential until you take that second look and then see all that they were birthed to be. And then it's your job, especially if you're an adult, to kind of help them, guide them into their purpose. So the I'm a Winner Project falls under our mental health friendly communities work, where we train faith leaders on the importance of understanding and supporting those who live with mental health challenges. That the, the common winner is designed to work in faith community and collaborate them with school settings for a long period of time with kids who are struggling. I'm going to ask anyone who doesn't have their phone on mute who's not speaking to please put it on mute. I'm getting these text messages from people saying, oh, tell them to put it on mute. Thank you, Pastor Jones. You could have said it too because so you're a pastor and people listen to you. But anyhow, 
this um, this um, this program was inspired by the fact that when you look at how you were when you were a kid growing up in church, often there was this grandmotherly type person who wasn't always friendly. She wasn't always smiling. No, she was. Was she Sister Shen? Denise? She wasn't always smiling. But while we were there at Ebenezer Baptist Church, she sat on the front row and every once in a while, when you were feeling at your lowest, she'd reach out, this church mother, she'd reach in her pocket and she would give you what we call church candy. Now they didn't always have records then. So that church candy might have a little lint on it, a little piece of hair, but when you put it in your mouth, it made you feel oh so good and you were seen. That is what we need in our communities to start healing again. What happened with Ben and I was no different than what happens quite a bit when we give people a chance to realize that they're a winner. We don't have funding in most county systems for programs like that. I did a project through Each Mind Matters, statewide Each Mind Matters. I see Dee, I had her green ribbon on. Um, and I was going out giving out the green ribbons and I was training African-American faith leaders on how to find usually seniors, retired individuals in their church communities and pairing them up with students that needed that extra special hug and kiss. And a lot of times individuals like Ben who hadn't tapped into his greatness yet but had the capacity to do so were identified through those relationships. So while we put a lot of pressure sometimes on individuals with saying, oh, you must excel, you must learn the science, technology, engineering, and math. But we forget what motivates individuals is connecting with their purpose. Sometimes in order to connect to the purpose, they have to look at the two letters that go, should go in front of STEM. Anybody have a guess about what you should have in place that helps a person realize they can do it and connect to their purpose? And, it's, it, and it is something that's taught in the classroom sometimes. It starts with the letter H. Whoever gets it wins a prize. In order for me to get something done, sometimes it's important for me to know someone else has done it. What, where do we learn about things that have already happened before? What class? I know we have teachers here, educators like Susan Horick on the call. What class is History. it? History. 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 Yes. History. History. So sometimes. I'll say it first. <laughs> sometimes history. Knowing someone built the pyramids, knowing someone who looked like you invented this or invented that makes you feel like you can do it. The other one is innovation, being innovative. So you don't have to necessarily be smart, but you have to be creative and can think. So rather than forcing STEM and telling individuals that they have to learn some subject matters that might be difficult for them to see themselves learning, we can start with history and innovation. And the STEM comes after that. Uh, African-Americans that go to study in historical black colleges tend to do better than African-Americans and graduate. Why is that? Because they're in a nurturing environment and they're taught the history of their people at the very first semester. And they make the programs a little um, more lengthy and stronger than what you would get in your regular classes. Is that Michelle William Smith not letting everybody see who she is? One yes, of the individuals is. who supports family members in Alameda County. <laughs> mm -hmm. I refer to her more than any other single family <laughs> educator. Thank you, Michelle. So you heard that. <laughs> All of those things are essential for supporting individuals to understand that <clears throat> their black minds matter too and that their lives matter. And so we've seen it happen over and over again when kids go off to college in the black historical universities, they tend to do better. We also, as a part of our mental health friendly communities team, and I'm gonna ask Pastor Jones to jump in here now, what's essential Pastor Jones and what part of the training do you facilitate? You would have to unmute yourself for us to hear you. <laughs> so as it relates to our primary training, core training, uh, and that's the role of faith 
and spirituality historically within our community and then also individually. It's, you know, whenever you're, and Gigi, you kind of alluded to this in the beginning, there was a parallel study or research done by uh, Soledad O'Brien a number of years ago when she had that series, Being Black in America. And, uh, and there was a survey done by the Pew Research, and Pew doesn't mean like church Pew, but a reputable research comparable to Gallup of uh, faith and spirituality within the African-American community. And it was, it was around the same as it was in California. 87% of those who responded um, had assessed and, and shared that their faith was absolutely critical. And it's not just for us as individuals, but also for um, and this current generation, but it goes, it goes back through the holes of the slave ships uh, to Africa and, uh, and faith to this very day. It is, it is the cord that binds us uh, to our past and that keeps us in our present and pulls us into our future. And so and one thing I like to share with individuals is when, when you, especially now in this era of, of I can't breathe, it, it's so reminiscent of the, of the holes of the slave ships and uh, you know the, the the oppression of of slavery, and uh, and of, of Jim Crow, and how the oxygen was just pulled. The attempt was to pull oxygen and to and to strangle and to suffocate our community. But the more you deny us, this is historically, physically, the more we rely upon our faith. And there's a there's a, a hymn that uh, some of you may be familiar with. Uh, the title of it is, We've Come This Far, and that's the title we, we attached to one of our trainings. Uh, We've Come This Far by Faith. And then it says, Leaning on the Lord. And uh, just, I was thinking of this, I mentioned this yesterday, in the, uh, the other day in the webinar. If any of you have seen the movie Harry, and I'm sure most of you have seen the movie Harry, a pivotal scene kind of in roots where they're, where the uh, where Toby is, I mean, the Kunch is being asked, what is his name? A pivotal scene in Harriet is when she makes the determination, I've got to get up, I can't breathe here. And I've, the, the air is much better in the North. And, and her parents say to her, go to the preacher. Go to, and the preacher lived in the church. And she had, I think the prior scene was the preacher on the porch of the big house preaching what I refer to as religious rhetoric or selective scriptures that condoned slavery and had inculcated it within the, uh, the intention was within the spirit, not just the mind, but the spirit and the soul of the enslaved Africans. And, uh, and his message was a selective message that had been filtered and approved by their oppressors. And, but it was not a message of hope. It was a message of, of uh, servitude and, slave, and enslavement. And she said, why would I want to go to the preacher after what he just, what he just, what I just heard is antithetical to what I, his preaching is suffocating me. And she, and, and the parents said, go to the church, go to the preacher. And when she went in and, and he opens, she knocked on the door, if you've seen it, and he opens the door and you can see it on her face. She's so apprehensive, but she listened to her parents. When he closed the door, he opened the door on the floor and down beneath the church that was a station in the Underground Railroad. And he had the capacity on one end, he taught the rhetoric publicly, but he was a man of faith and hope. And it was not just him, but it was representative of the role of a denied institution at that time, the black church. And so our roots, you know, you on the surface, like at the church on the surface is what you see, institutions. But beneath the surface, when you open that door, those are the roots of our faith that keeps us connected uh, as a community uh, and as individuals. Great. To this day, and let me mention this, Gigi, and oftentimes people say, well, this new generation, they're not into, uh, let me tell you, this new generation is no different than previous generation. All 18s to 30 must discover their own. And then they, and then they articulate the gospel or they articulate their faith in a way that's unique to their generation, but they have within them, we have within us, the roots and the DNA that enabled us to survive those holes. And faith did not begin on the plantations. 
faith survived the plantations and it began uh, in, in North Africa because it was the greatest theological minds in the history of Christianity were not in Jerusalem. They were in North Africa. Okay. Anybody have any questions about that? I don't see any hands up. Barbara, what about you? So what Pastor Jones is saying and what we talk about, oh, there's Patricia Nunley. Patricia? Hey, hey, hey Gigi, how you doing? Hey, doctor. Um, hey, uh, 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 Pastor, um, so thank you, thank you for that. Um, I love that because I am, um, I I'm a member of the Association of Black Psychologists, uh, which is an African center group. And I'm one of the uh, strong, strong Christians, right? And so, of course, there are many, it's like, well, I, I don't get how you can be both, right? And it's my both is because I believe in liberation theology. So, um, but someone explained something to me, and I, I'm probably going to get the year wrong, that I thought it's this group of like this radical deacon. And so basically, they were saying the church um, was the black church. You know, it was about business until about 1960 when uh, the government bought them, bought them out and shut them down and uh, basically uh, stopped the liberation theology. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Can you explain that better than I can? And I'll be quiet now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to do some, some research on that. Uh, but what I will say is that when we speak of liberation theology, the theology of black folk predate liberation theology. Liberation theology is indigenous to the black experience in America. But Christian, and I'm speaking from the perspective of Christian, Christian, not black Christian theology, Christian theology when it comes to grace, when it comes to salvation, when it comes to Trinitarian doctrine, all of that, I want you to hear me carefully, all of that began in North Africa centuries before the transatlantic slave uh, uh, movement. It's important for, and, and this, is not, this is not an effort to proselytize or anything, but that's one of, the, one of the misnomers as it relates to the black Christian experience is that it's oftentimes limited to the American experience where just as every person on this call your DNA is in North Africa. As a humane being, there was a scientific, there was a research done, scientific research done called the Genome Project. Whether you're Christian, religious, or spiritual, this was not done from a Christian or religious perspective, but it traced the origin of man. And they traced it, the origin of man, all the way back to a northern part of Africa and they refer to the first, what they were, and again, this is not dealing with creation theology. The first man is called Adam. That's how they just refer to it. And woman, Eve. And they trace the origin to Northern Africa, which coincidentally happens to be in the same geographical area as the Garden of Eden that's described within the scripture. So our existence as human beings across, some of y'all on here are just lighter. And some of us are darker, but all of us are, have Af are of African descent. And then also from the Christian theological perspective, our DNA or our theological, we call um, parameters and constructs have been not, not black, but period, across the board, have been shaped, debated, defined, and determined in North Africa. So it, and that is then what influences what we today in America refer to as liberation theology. The entire, if you think about it, liberation theology has its roots in the garden as man was bound and then liberated. And he was, that's a whole nother thing. Y'all have to come to my church to get the rest of that. So, <laughs> so I, I have to do some research as it relates to what you just mentioned. So I'm going to make a note of that and I'll look that, look that up. And I'm gonna I go see share. if I can find it. Wait, I'm sorry, Judy. I'm gonna go see if I can find my notes because it's I, I, in my notes it has the name of the deacons and where they came from. So I'm okay. Gonna... And I'll share for any of you who watched the movie Roots. 
the pivotal scene that Pastor Jones made reference to that would allow you to embrace the fact that our faith practice started in Africa when uh, Kunta, remember, was just born. What did his father do? He picked him up and he held him to the skies and said, the only one greater than thyself, meaning God. So that was in Africa. That wasn't here. He later got captured and brought and to be enslaved. So one of the um, reasons Barbara wanted to do this training and why I gave this topic was because it's really important for us to think about the resiliency. We are in a, a time like no other. People keep saying, oh, we've been through this. We have never. African-Americans, just like white counterparts, Latin Latinx, and APA, none of us have ever went through it. If, if you're in this world, none of us have ever went through a time like this, COVID-19. No, nobody. People say, oh, we're used to pandemics. No, we're not. We're not. This is the first of its kind. We've never experienced. We've had economic downturns before. And each, one, each time things like this have happened, African-Americans have had the most difficult time climbing back into a place of stability. So 2008, we had not, remember the economic downturn? Mm -hmm. African-Americans did not gain the financial stability as every other community did. Trainings like this are to give you tools so that you understand as well within your power to position yourself to do better. We heard from Todd, we heard from Ton, who is a mother who I, I guarantee you. People keep saying, why are you, why do you use Ton? Because she tells the story on the worst outcome possible for your loved one. And if she can stand up and look as beautiful as she did with the worst outcome possible for your loved one, then there's no excuse for anyone else who has, uh, 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 who are in a situation with a young person who lives with mental illness. I will also pay homage to Peggy Rahman, who lost her beautiful daughter, Sarah, who was, um, you know, a dear friend of mine and helped me with the spirituality work. These are the worst outcomes yet they still continue to fight for other families. Peggy is the president uh, of the uh, NAMI in uh, Alameda County. Peggy, you want to say anything? Uh, I'll have to unmute. Let me see. Okay. Sure. I, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you for having this, Gigi. And I'm so glad to be able to be here and, and uh, to be part of everything that you do. Uh, you know, this is one of the things that makes me cry when I see, excuse me, every time somebody dies. Yeah. It, and when I hear, so hear about it, I just, I can't stand it. Yeah. So I want to be able to have something to do. So thank you. Thank you, Peggy. Peggy's dear daughter, Sarah, used to come into my office when I worked with Alameda County and put a perfect filing system in place, clear my desk, do it all, and it lasts for about two months. And then I have to call it back to fix it all over again. So I, I, I really missed um, Sarah. And uh, we have a failed mental health system for all communities. It yes. does not meet the needs. And then when you start looking at disparities, in my opinion, African-Americans suffer most. Why? Because too often our services are given in the most restrictive environments, the most restrictive Restrictive. There's language barriers for some communities, but there's no specific programs in most counties to address the needs of African Americans. That's why I'm privileged to work at NAMI Contra Costa, where I have the opportunity to hire people like Eddie Morris. He's sitting there in the big chair, and he also works at John George Pavilion. So guess what? He works with the individuals who are sent there on 5150s. And I can't tell you how much it means to family members to have Eddie be there and understand what it's like for them. Did you want to share anything, Eddie? Yes, I'd like to share a little bit. I really appreciate this, Gigi. It got me the time where I had to, I'm doing a training tomorrow at my other job at Telecare. And it gave me an opportunity to really sit and just listen. 
and I enjoy sitting and listening because traditionally our people, we're moving so fast with so much going on, we never get a chance to just sit and listen, absorb. We're historically, this is what Gigi said, we've never been through this. I think the last pandemic was in 1920. Our generation never had to live through this. Um, our calls are coming more rapid. It's just, and the young brothers just spoke earlier. I, I, my heart went out to them because I tell my clients almost every single day, when you get discharged, just take your meds. Don't use drugs. Follow instructions. And I mean, I wish the brother was back on, but I just want to just uh, thank everybody in this circle right here because this was very special to me. Because just because we might work in the field, that don't mean the field don't affect us every day. Okay. Thank you, Eddie. And I want to give a shout out to Dr. Sunshine, who holds it down in Richmond, California. He's been doing the family to family class and he puts a special spin on it to make sure that the needs of African Americans are met. Dr. Sunshine, can you unmute yourself and say anything? I know you're here because you, you filled up the chat box. What does he say? His, his button is not working, so he's not able. Okay, well, I'll move right along. This is a conversation. I just saw Douglas Don. Douglas, you want to share with us what you see and experience every day? Doug is our consultant. He, we brought him in to deal with the most horrific cases that we face, criminal justice involved individuals. Doug, what do you basically see in your work? We can't hear you. We still can't hear you. We got to get this guy a computer. <laughs> we can't hear Doug, but uh, I'll share with you. We can't hear you, Doug, that the bulk of the cases that Doug works with in Contra Costa County, along with Addie, that are the most horrific, the most difficult to um, support are usually young African-American males. Am I right or wrong? He's yeah, shaking he's his head up and down. Right. We have a system that does not know how to appropriately serve this community of individuals. And so too often they fail first. Ton didn't get a, a chance to share this, but sadly, in and why I'm so connected to the work that she's doing is that some of the advice she got was her son carried a pocket knife he'd been carrying for a very long time. The only way she was able to get him served 5150 was because he had the pocket knife. Do you know that months later when he was doing well, he stopped doing well, not because he stopped taking his meds, but because he got charged with having the pocket knife, the tool that his mom used to get him the services was his downfall because when the letters start coming from the courts and he had that pocket knife charge against him, he obsessed about that. It should not be a system that works in such a manner that a person has to fail before they can get the treatment services that they deserve. We're working to get his, his, his get that expunged from his record, but that's what happened and that is not okay. I also know that Barbara White from the city of Berkeley is on here, and Barbara is my, what do they call it, road dog. She does really innovative services for African Americans and every other community you could think of in the city of Berkeley. So while I was working in Alameda County with the 17 cities there, she was working in, in, in Berkeley, doing the work there. Right, Barbara? Yeah, Barbara, did you, uh -huh. yeah you I'm here. Um, how's it? How's everybody doing? Yeah, great. Uh, yeah, well, you was working with your uh, 12 cities. Okay. Oh. <laughs> no, I would, I would often go out of the state too. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, definitely uh, Gigi providing the services for the county was really a blessing. And um, I'm not sure if we're getting that same detailed type of service delivery because it really requires someone to be bold and to really speak to the truth of the service delivery that's really required. And a lot of times when you do that, you're putting yourself at risk uh, in the uh, bureaucracies that we work in. And so a lot of times when things get done, it's because people have taken a risk 
to their career, to their livelihood. And uh, any of us that are professionals, we know not that many people will do that. There just isn't that many people that will do that um, outside of people like Gigi and others. Um, not that many. Uh, so I just want to appreciate the work you do for uh, those who basically need someone to speak up for them. Um, not only just the African-American community, because you, like I, we support all marginalized communities. However, we do understand that when it comes to inequities and disparities, that our community is at the bottom, mm. at the bottom of everything in every system there is. So I'm just really pleased with all this alleged talk about reimagining how we can be as America, as Americans, and how we can help to uh, uplift African Americans that something seriously comes out of this because not only uh, in regards to our mental mental health um, but in regards to just our community health so this is an individual for us as black folks this is a community issue um, and so uh, we really need to be as a community to be reinvested in to really help us to uh, deal with all the inequities and disparities. And then the last thing I'll say is that we actually have the ability to do it ourselves. And one of the things that frustrates me is that a lot of times uh, allies, or now I think it's being called um, uh, accomplice, uh, they really, um, and, and I applaud people that wanna help and support, but don't get it twisted because we have the ability to do this stuff ourselves. We're intelligent people and we can work hand in hand. Uh, we can lead the process. And, and what I'm starting to see now, and I don't know if other people are starting to see this, is that our story, <laughs> our issue is basically being uh, taken up by others, which is great. But don't put us in the back of the line or the back of the bus, it's our story, our issues, we're intelligent enough to be able to deal and drive these processes in, in collaboration with others to help out. So I'm really concerned about how I'm seeing the process uh, unwind to a certain extent. Uh, anybody that's been in America, like most of us have been for a long time, uh, we know how things usually play out. So I just wanna say, uh, just giving props to intelligent black women. I'm going to talk about black women. Black men, y'all okay too. But I'm going to say <laughs> for black women, I'm going to give us props because we know what we deal with in America. I'm sorry. We deal with so much mess in America and we're the backbone, the backbone of America. Thank you. I concur. Um, uh, Sister, Sister Gigi, I wanted to, uh, to say something. Um, to everybody who works for Gigi, Gigi hired you or whatever, please protect her in the way that we were not able to do when she was um, in Alameda County. Because I'm telling you, that sister, she did so much for us, but she paid such a big, 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 big price. Um, it worked yeah, so well. Complaining now. I'm, I'm, I'm in Contra Costa County where I live. I'm at NAMI Contra Costa County where I am embraced, where we're doing great work for all communities. So sometimes what some people set you up for failure, actually it winds up being the best thing for you. I'm retired. you're a child of God. That's why, because God had God. My sister had retired from juvenile hall and she was sleeping in and I was feeling a little envious about it. And next thing I know, here I am two years after her able to do the same thing, but then travel into Concord and make a difference in people's lives without a, 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 a knee in my neck. Because I actually thought when I got hired to do the work in Alameda County, they wanted me to do it. Why would I think otherwise? And I saw, I'd see Dr. Sumshai down there in the corner. At least now I can see you. Did you want to say Yeah, anything? I, I turned my mic on too. I'm using my phone and my computer. Okay, you want to share something? Well, I'm just blessed to be part of this gathering. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an educator. I've been teaching for 50 years. And one of the truths that I had to, in my heart, address was the lying myths of history and how it was turning young people, like it turned me, like I was lied to, into a chattel slave. 
it took me over 50 years to be able to understand that. And so now when I'm teaching my students, I don't use the word history. When I do, I say, these are the lying myths that you have been taught, like the lying myth of white supremacy and race to keep you a victim. Throw those off. It's time to have healing conversations about our story. Our story. And I'm not the first person who think who thinks this way. I know you probably heard of John Henry Clark and Yusef Ben Yokanan, um, um, Francis Cress Welsing, all of these people who are gone now started this back in the 1920s and 1930s. And I'm just old enough and live long enough to have had them as my teachers. Thank you, Dr. Sunshine. Now, I, I, I know we have to start winding up. And so I just wanted to share what has empowered me lately is really making a difference and making sure there's justice for Miles Hall. So remember to go to that website, go to that website. We will be having a pilot program named after him. Some funding will come from Walnut Creek. We went to the mayor's conference and every mayor agreed we need a non-police um, response. We know there's going to be times where we need police, but they should never show up as first responders when an individual is unarmed, right? Never. It doesn't make sense. So what we'd like to see happen is funding specific for a non-police response. And because Miles and um, the advocacy around him made such a big difference, you have over, what is it now, six, 700 individuals who are a part of the group really supporting the effort around this. Individuals who didn't know him and individuals who knew him. Shiyama, a friend of Tan, started this FOSIC group and no one knew how much it would take off. What's special about it is people from all backgrounds, walks, because guess what? Most of us are impacted by mental illness in some way. We're their family member, we live with it ourselves, or we know someone we care about who's living with it. So that's why we have so many people. If you're interested in supporting it, just go to the website and do what you can. If you're interested in supporting NAMI Contra Costa County, go to our website. Today, I just filmed a PSA because I'm working in Contra Costa County and I was a part of a task force. I'm pretty perturbed that the numbers for African Americans living with COVID-19 continue to grow, right? They're most at risk. And we're, I've been waiting for three months for the county to do what it needs to do to actually put a plan in place so that we don't have more people infected with COVID and losing their life. And it just has not happened. So I, I did a PSA and it's on my Facebook page and I'm hoping that faith leaders can look at it and send it out. And sometimes you just have to do stuff for yourself and not wait. I'm tired of waiting. Um, I, when I see something, if I have the skill set to do it, I'm gonna go out and do it on my own without waiting. So. That's where we're at with that. Does anybody else have anything pressing they want to share before we allow you all to get off the call? And I'll encourage everyone to get out, drink, do your walking every day, drink water every day, avoid negative press every day, um, eat healthy food, avoid sugar, listen to music that gives you a peaceful sense of self, Get up and get dressed, even if you're not going anywhere. Please do that. Even if you don't have to go anywhere, get up and get dressed, okay? Because we tend to fall into depression where we're not taking care of ourselves. And um, other than that, we're available at NAMI Contra Costa County. If anyone is feeling anxious or feeling of depression, we're available to support you. Um, Again, if you would are interested in supporting the Justice for Miles Hall, go to that website. And then Barbara Howard, who led this effort, is going to close us out. Thank you, Barbara, for having us, giving us this opportunity. Well, you know, you're welcome. And I am very, very full. And I believe in allowing our stories to be heard in any platform that I um, create. That is my duty and my responsibility to do so. And, and I just want to thank Gigi and her guests and all of the audience. We are so honored and grateful 
um, that you participated in tonight, your stories, your, your smile, everything was for us and we needed to be together. And as they were saying earlier, please stay safe, put your mask on, be around your family members, love on each other, even though in a distance, you know, we have to continue to do that as what Gigi has said. Miss Samantha will also close us off with closing remarks, but BH Brilliant Minds Project Inc. is honored to have had this opportunity um, through the Akinani Foundation So Love Can Win to bring this uh, series to you. We will continue having series. Please go to our website at www bhbrilliantminds.org and you will see um, the upcoming series and you will see it also on your Facebook Live. But Miss Samantha, can you um, tap in and share with us? Yes. Go ahead, sweetie. Through 12th grade, the previous video. I continue to, um, excuse me, just be grateful yeah <clears throat> that this conversation continues to be intergenerational and i think that as we think about this moment in time how we're thinking about protecting our health as well as our wealth our wealth is not just the things that we acquire it's actually our minds mm -hmm. and this idea about thought leadership right that's something that can't be purchased right so it's us being able to bring our minds together and do the unthinkable and that is to speak more than ever in these times so thank you for this this community of people just coming together and my hope is that we can continue to keep the conversation keep the conversation going thank you everybody and, and we always close our meetings with say his name miles hall and to miles all of the Hall's. other ones that oh, we will continue Yep. Stay yeah. on the wall. We got to continue. We have to continue to build the wall. Stay on the wall. As Gigi said, just do your part. Stay in your lane and do what you can do for yourself, for our community, and for us to continue to turn this world around. God has a sense of humor. There's been plagues in the Bible, but however, this puts us all on one playing field. It doesn't, you don't have to have money. It, it across the board. Sometimes the um, things that seems like this bad can turn around for our good to turn things back in order to what it should, what we should really be doing and how we should really be taking care of ourselves. So as we said, this is not anything um, that we will stop. We will continue. We won't break. We won't stop. We are powerful. And the word for tonight is being consistent. We will Amen. be consistent and the work your, that we're doing. Take off your mute and say his name. Miles Hall. Oh. Say his name. Miles Hall. 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 Say his name. Miles Hall. Say his name. Say his name. Miles Hall. Thank you. And Remember all, that all name because the family members create change. Yes, and for all of the members, not members, for all of the folks that are dealing with family members that has mental health issues, please. We beg you, we beseech you to get in contact with um, Miss Gigi and see how we continue to rally around our folks and make a difference and um, support one another. This is what it's about. I believe it's all about supporting each other. And Thank Sister you. Barbara, Sister yes, Barbara, sir. what is that photo on the back of the wall behind you? Because I got a picture of Harriet Tubman uh, on the wall behind wow. me right over there. Who was that know, picture? I, I have. It is a statue. Hold on for one second. Let me put that. It's Gigi, a warrior. I gotta go for her walk while you guys have your photo conversation. Thank you guys. A, <laughs> can you Bye, see everybody. it? But I understand Bye. what you're saying because I've seen that same photo. It looks like Harry Tubman, but it's a warrior, an African warrior.